All right, we are live. Thank you for joining us today. Today we're going to be talking about everyone's favorite Muslim apologist, Yasser Qadi, and what he teaches us about abrogation. As Christians who are interested in Islam, uh, many of you, probably most of you, are familiar with the doctrine of abrogation. However, you probably have an incomplete understanding of it. We kind of think of it as just one Quran verse canceling out another Quran verse, but actually there's a lot more to it. You kind of have to be an expert in the field to fully understand it, and Muslim apologists take advantage of that fact when talking to non-Muslims and lay Muslims and really distort what's going on. We're going to look at Qadi's textbook on the subject and kind of get a more complete understanding today. Before we do that, let me open us with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time together and the technology that allows us to connect with fellow Christians and non-Christians around the world. We ask that anyone listening today, whether they are a Christian or Muslim or otherwise, approach the material with an open mind, that they not simply continue to believe their preconceived notions, but uh, take a good look at what we have to say, and if what we say is true, that they change their opinion accordingly. Uh, along those lines, we ask that you be with us and guide our discussion today, that you give us the words to say and ensure that we only speak what is true and useful. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I am joined today by Lloyd de Jong. It's been a while since he was on my channel. I'll give him a chance to kind of introduce himself and the subject. Uh, yeah. Hey, everyone. Um, good to be back on the channel. Thank you, Thaddeus. It has been a while. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, my channel's been doing really well. It's grown. I'm over 1,100 subs at the moment. And uh, I do want to thank you. And uh, as well as Sonia Azam, I've sent her a message of thanks for, for, for well, getting me started and also for helping me uh, get to where I am. You know, your support's been invaluable, so thank you. And yeah, guys, as you know, um, where I spend my time focusing is on Islamic law, uh, which is the Sharia and the Fiqh. And I had a very interesting um, stream yesterday. Someone told me they thought that the Sharia was just a part of Islam. And they were very surprised when I showed them that Sharia is Islam. The Sharia completely explains Islam. It is the ultimate culmination. The Sharia is the ultimate product of Islam. The Sharia is everything that there is about Islam, from its politics, from its system of warfare, its governance, its social control. Everything is within the Sharia. So the way it does religion, all of those aspects are there. So Sharia is the ultimate fruit, the ultimate product of Islam. So yeah, so it ultimately interprets the Quran and the Hadith. And today we want to talk about abrogation. And recently I had someone that rather dishonestly tried to claim that, well, even Christians abrogate, you know, even Christianity, you abrogate things. The term ag abrogation means to cancel. However, Islam is a very detailed doctrine. We're going to go through Yasser Qadi's discussion on this because obviously Qadi has been very prominent in the news lately and um, I thought this would be an interesting time to show what he says about the subject. He is a PhD in Islam, uh, received at Yale as I recall. He is a, an accredited Islamic sheikh and of course he is very very famous. He runs the Islamic Seminary of America. So th these are the words of a very highly educated, very very prominent, probably the most prominent Muslim in America and the most educated. So his word should should hold very strong validity. And so we don't have to listen to lay Muslims. We can get it from the horse's mouth, as it were. And um, yeah, we can see wh why we get lied to, what we are told, and look at some of these issues. And please uh, put your questions in the chat. Love to take those. And um, yeah, thanks, guys. We'll let's let's dive in. Thaddeus, you, anything from you? Yeah, excellent. Uh, I would like to encourage everyone who hasn't already done so to just subscribe to Lloyd's channel. The link is in the video description box. Lately, he's been uh, doing at least one live stream a week. He's been uh, doing a series on 
whether uh, Paul corrupted Christianity, whether Paul teaches a different message than the rest of the Bible. So definitely check out his channel. Uh, he releases his channel is similar to mine in that it has some material on Christian apologetics, but it is primarily focused on uh, polemics against Islam. So definitely check that out. So without further ado, we can dive into the subject. Hi everyone. Hi Chloe. Hi Kale. Good to see you guys in the channel and in the chat. Um, yeah, so maybe I will start sharing. So which screen do I share? It's going to ask me uh, that one, screen two. Okay, I'll just share the entire screen. It's going to make my life easier. All right. Okay, guys. So we all know who Yasser Qadi is. I don't have to speak about this, but we need to understand that the vast majority of the Quran is abrogated. It is canceled. The only reason that these verses have any validity are obviously one, they allow Muslims to deceive you with verses that are mansuk, abrogated. Two, they have not yet managed to establish a caliphate where they have the full application of the Sharia. So it is not time for them to completely embrace those verses that are still relevant. And therefore they still apply those verses that are canceled. Right? And, and of course the Sharia will never be fully applied until such time as Jesus comes back, destroys the church, kills the Christians, kills the pigs, kills the Jews, and then of course Islam will be established on earth according to their end times eschatology, and then you'll see the full blossoming of the Sharia on earth. ISIS obviously tried it, we know how that went, and also the Taliban tried this, we know how that went. So yeah, okay, so let me... Right, so before we begin, um, I've often brought up interesting facts about Islam that uh, I think are relevant for people to know. As we know, she was six, he was 53, and just a few things that I found roughly two dozen of these Sahih Hadith, right? And um, something you should know. Aisha said, I often scraped semen from the garment of the Messenger of Allah with my hand. That's in Ibn Majah, Volume 1, Book 1, Hadith 537. That's from the Kitab al-Sitta. Aisha said, I used to scrape off the semen from the garment of the Messenger of Allah. I don't think there are equivalent passages in the Gospels that speak of six-year-old girls scraping off Jesus' garment. I do know people touch these garments for healing, but I'm not sure about how many of them came in with semen under their fingernails the way Aisha did. And the third one, in case I found semen on the garment of the Messenger of Allah dried up, I scraped it off with my nails. Sahih Muslim, both of those, book two, Hadith 567 and Hadith 572. There's at least two dozen of these that I found. And uh, yeah, welcome to Muhammad. Any comments from you, Thaddeus? <coughs> well, I, I don't know. Maybe the, all of these passages have been abrogated and we can no longer believe them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe not. Um, yeah. Okay, well, moving on to the meat of the subject. So if I've often been told, and perhaps you've often been told, that there is no abrogation in Islam. Lay Muslims will often come along and say, well, I've told you there isn't. And for a Muslim to come and tell you whatever they tell you in the comments section, that to them is a refutation. To them, a refutation is not a detailed scholarly rebuttal. It is simply a retort. That is considered a refutation, right? So... And they will often tell you, no, there isn't, because they don't want you knowing the secrets of Islam. And of course, they always tell us that hadiths cannot abrogate the Quran. This is absolutely not true, and Yasser Qadi is going to explain this to us. So, I've done this on Thaddeus' channel. We've had a discussion on how Allah fixed Muhammad's mistakes, and how hadith will abrogate the Quran. I've got a much fuller um, discussion with Thaddeus, which was like a two-hour discussion previously. You can find that. However, let's just have a look at Yasser Qadi's textbook. Now, I will say that you got it, yeah? As you can say, before you dive in, I'll just say that I will put a link to our previous discussion on abrogation in the comments after the video. Oh, God, yeah, whatever was left by each of the flies to care of disgusting. Yeah, Allah should abrogate the Quran, yeah. So, yeah, so this discussion more or less confines itself to this textbook of Yasser Qadi himself, right? Now, Abrogation is also known as nusk, right? And he has in chapter 13, also, um, I'm not sure, did you add a link to the book 
uh, on your. Uh, I didn't think of that, but I'll add that as well. Okay, yeah, it's on my on my on my stream on this. Um, there is a, uh, a link. It's on archive.org, so you can find this on archive.org and read it for yourself, right? So it is called NUSC, and he has this chapter on abrogation. So he goes through it in quite some detail. I will say, take whatever Yasukari says with a little grain of salt, or maybe two or three bags worth, right? <laughs> we need to get a second opinion on this. So, yeah. No, I was just laughing. <laughs> okay, no. So the definition of NUSC. Now, both of the words that he speaks of, NASIC and MANSIC, which is, which is the abrogating and the abrogated come from the root NS, which has the following meanings, to remove, to abolish, to abrogate, he tells us. For example, Allah says in the Quran, we do not abrogate a verse or cause it to be forgotten, except that we bring something that is better. So when he removes something, he when it, rather, Allah is an it since Allah is genderless, just that the Arabic language tends to be very masculine oriented, so it uses the, the masculine pronoun he, but according to Islamic theology, Allah is, an, is genderless, so Allah is it. So when it abrogates a verse, it brings something better. So now he explains that this is about replacing or superseding verses, right? So a new verse always supersedes or replaces a previous verse. So as for its definition in Islamic sciences, the abrogation of a ruling by a ruling that was revealed after it. Therefore, at least two rulings must be involved, the Nasik and the Mansuk, the abrogating and the abrogated. The Nasik ruling is the ruling that repeals the Mansuk, right? Nasik, the active participle, is the ruling that does the abrogating, or the Mansuk, the passive form, is the ruling that is abrogated. Now, he mentions there must be at least two, because one of the rules of the doctrine of abrogation, the Islamic doctrine, is that there can be more than one Nasik or Mansuk verses. In other words, one verse can abrogate multiple verses, and multiple verses can abrogate one verse. Just something to keep in mind. Any questions or comments so far? Oh, we have a comment here from mm -hmm. Mojo Dude that says abrogation is a sign of the insufficiency of the Mohammedan concept of God. And I would agree with that. If your God is revealing information, which he then later changes his mind about, of course, Muslims would not agree that he changed his mind. But regardless, if he's revealing a command that he says is for all time and then later reveals a different command that overrides it, there seems to be something wrong with your God. Yeah. Now, earlier I had a discussion with uh, with someone called Lee G. I'm not sure if that's his real name, but this is the name that he uses. He was trying to convince me that Christianity also abrogates. Now, abrogation is very specifically, as a lot, as the scholars of Islam tell us, to deal with with contradictions. These are contradictions that are serious, and abrogation was the only way to deal with this. As the top scholars of Islam also tell us, Allah had to abrogate certain narrations, certain passages, because Muhammad made mistakes. Muhammad forgot things, misquoted things, made all sorts of errors, and Allah had to abrogate Muhammad's mistakes. I can show you that later on if you want me to, but this is what the scholars actually tell us. Right Now, for instance, we have covenants in the Bible. So you have a covenant with Moses, but God's covenants are valid for a time and a place, a geography, a person, and a time. Is that correct, Thaddeus? Yes. So those are contracts. Those are agreements. And once that agreement is done, once that time is done, once those conditions are met, that contract falls by the wayside. A new contract is begun. The new contract may contain elements of the previous contract, or it might be a brand new one. <clears throat> Abrogation is to deal with errors, to deal with mistakes, to deal with serious conflict, serious contradictions. Those are different concepts. And this is something that they will try to push on you, but don't allow them to do that. So it gives us the breakdown of the- but Before you go on, I, I would like to also point out that all of these uh, abrogations took place during the life of Muhammad. It's not like, the, like in Christianity where the law was revealed to Moses and then the covenant was in place for more than a thousand years until Jesus came and fulfilled the law, completed the old covenant it's uh muhammad revealed something mm -hmm. one year the next year he said something different and then someone pointed it out and all of a sudden they had to come up with an explanation why muhammad was saying different contradictory things and right. that's where we get abrogation from 
Right, exactly. So Yasser Qadi goes on to tell us the phrase, the abrogation implies that the first ruling has been completely repealed. Completely repealed, a law that he struck off the books. This differentiates it from another phenomenon that he speaks of called Tarsis, but we're not going to get into that. He then goes to say, Nask involves abrogating the first ruling in toto, right, completely, i.e., this rule is not applied in any circumstances or conditions. So this rule has actually been completely completely cancelled. The difference between Nusk and, okay, so we'll not talk about Tarsis. This also implies that Nusk must involve an actual abrogation of a plea of a previous Islamic law. Now, he tells us in order for Nusk to occur, there must have been previously existed an Islamic ruling on exactly the same subject, which was then abrogated by a later ruling. So, these are the words of Yasser Qadi himself, which is very useful for us. And Understand that we can learn everything we need to know from the scholars of Islam. We don't have to listen to the words of lay Muslims. There's plenty of documentation out there now with a thorough scholarly interpretation of everything within Islam. Do be aware that certain of these documents do have a certain propaganda value. You need to get a second opinion. And ultimately, you will refer to the Sharia of the original four Imams, because those four Imams of the Hanafi, the Hanbali, the Maliki, and Shafi schools are considered to be without error. They're considered to be scholars who have total mastery of the sciences of Islam, of the law of Islam, and therefore they have made no errors. So therefore they are considered to be completely reliable. So the phrase of a ruling implies that Nusk is only valid in laws and not in belief, Akida or the creed, right? Like we have the Nicene Creed. So this valid invalidates law in Islam. So law legislation, Right. This is not, and also Muslims will try to imply that that canon law is the same as actual civil legal legislation within a government, within a country. That is not the case. Right. So any comments from you, Thaddeus? Uh, yeah, that, that's a good distinction to make because that's one thing that um, Muslim apologists will abuse. You know, there's two extremes. One says that abrogation doesn't exist at all to avoid you know, this uncomfortable doctrine. The other tries to use it to explain everything. But in fact, it can't resolve any kind of contradiction that is not related to law or practice of Muslims. So earlier when I joked that maybe these hadith about uh, Aisha scraping semen off Muhammad's garments have been abrogated, well, that's not actually possible because that's a uh, something telling us about something factual that happened. It's not a command. Only a command can be abrogated. Right. Good, good distinction. Good point. Yeah. So Nusk is valid in law. Now, notice they have here. OK, so Nusk cannot abrogate Allah's names, his attributes or the day of judgment and other matters related to the fundamentals of belief. Right. Concerning these non abrogated beliefs, Allah says he has ordained for you the same religion which he ordained for Noah. So Allah has ordained for Muhammad the same religion that he ordained for Noah. So Noah According to Yasser Qadi, it's Muslim. I'm not sure that Noah had a Quran. If he had a Quran, I'm not aware of it. If Noah was a practicing Muslim and there was any evidence of that from the time of Noah to the time of Abraham and David and who are all Muslims, well, yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of that. But yeah, maybe you can fill me in, Thaddeus. Let me know. So, and you're going to say something? Uh, uh, it you know, it's a rhetorical question, so I didn't need to reply. But yes, yeah. there's absolutely no historical evidence for any of these claims. You know, the Muslims say all of the prophets were Muslim, that everyone was uh, Muslim in, in what we would call Jewish history. Jesus was Muslim, etc. His disciples were Muslim, etc., etc. Then we look in history and we can't find any example of even the core doctrines of Islam in these teachings. You know, we can't find anyone who said anything equivalent to a Shahada, for example. Obviously, they Correct. wouldn't have known the name of Muhammad, but they, they I, I don't know of anyone that said, uh, I believe in, in uh, Yahweh alone and Moses is his messenger. I mean, it's just silly. Yeah, correct. And you cannot even find the double Shahada that Muslims practice today in the Quran. It doesn't exist. Feel free to show me where it is. You'll only find the Shahada, which speaks of Allah. Right. So the idea that there has to be belief in Allah and Muhammad. That is not in the Quran. That's outside the Quran. That's a later development. That is not the development within the Quran itself. So if the Quran is supreme, well, maybe it's not.
<laughs> right. So, <clears throat> so Mo was ordained to follow Islam the way Noah did. And of course, in that we have ordained for Abraham, Moses, and Jesus, saying that you should establish the religion and make no divisions in it. So apparently Jesus, Moses, Abraham, David, all the prophets were Muslims. And somehow we have conspired to cover that fact up from the Old and the New Testaments. Now, <clears throat> He goes on to say, also, the ruling that is abrogated must originate in the Quran or the Sunnah. So in other words, the Sunnah is also a matter of law. Okay, it is, it is actually something that holds the entire force of law because those are the words of Muhammad. And according to the Sharia, the words of Muhammad are equivalent with equal legal force as the word of Allah. So Nusk cannot occur with respect to Ijma, consensus, or Qiyas, analogy. These are the forms of reasoning. And the consensus is the ultimate law within Islam because it is the agreement of the scholars on what constitutes Islamic doctrine, what the Quran means, what the Sunnah means. Don't forget the Sunnah is not just the Hadith. The Sunnah is technically the Sirah as well, Muhammad's biographies, right? The Gospels of Muhammad. So the it says Nask cannot occur with respect to Ijma. So you cannot abrogate the consensus of the scholars. So which, this also implies that the consensus of the scholars stands permanently. Whatever they say goes. That cannot be changed. So in other words, no ruling that is derived from Ijma or Kias can be abrogated. So the reasoning of the scholars, the argumentation of the scholars stands forever. Any comments, Thaddeus? Yeah, well, yeah, this is a really important point to remember. Uh, mm -hmm. Lloyd alluded to this earlier when he said you have to go back to the four schools, the four Imams, um, because once there's a consensus on Islamic uh, doctrine and Islamic law, it cannot change. And uh, I don't know if it's on the slide or not, but Yasser Qadi explains that this is because abrogation could only take place while Muhammad was alive. That's the only time when mm -hmm. Allah could give new revelation, supposedly. And he promised to protect the scholars, the consensus of scholars from error. So once a consensus forms, that cannot change. Islam cannot change in that respect. At least uh, what we call, what, what can reasonably call, be called uh, Islam in the line of traditional belief. Uh, you know, of course, in the modern society, we allow anyone to claim any belief system, regardless of whether they believe in it. So we're not talking about, you know, the, no one can say, I'm a Muslim and not follow Islam. Well, of course, that's possible. But if someone wants to really follow what has been historic Islam, what the commands of their supposed prophet enabled, the, then they have to follow the original scholars. They can't adapt to modern times. Right. Yeah. So Nas can only occur during the lifetime of the prophet, whereas Ijma and Kiyas must occur after the prophet as any student of the study of Islamic law knows, therefore these cannot be abrogated. Now he says, you know, of course, the book, this is in the chapter in Introduction to the Sciences of the Quran is the book. You can find it on archive.org or check my channel. There'll be a download link for it in my video on this subject. Lastly, this phrase implies that the understanding of a verse, the mafhum, can also be abrogated. Even though it's explicit wording, the mantuk remains applicable. This is very important. So you can have a verse that says the sky is blue. You can have another verse that now says the sky is green. The second verse abrogates the first, so the sky has now become green, right? And that's so. But you can have a verse that has no verse that abrogates it, but the verse says, the verse says that up is down, right? Up is now down. That's what the verse says, or whatever. Or the verse, no, sorry, the verse says that um, the verse says that water is wet, right? So now there's a verse in the Quran that says the water is wet. However, that is the mantuk. That's the wording. The wording cannot change because the wording is the wording. The word, remember, not, not one letter of the Quran has changed, right? This is the perfect preservation of the Quran. However, according to other aspects of history of Islam, of the actions of Muhammad, other verses, what they say is holon, but the meaning of that verse has changed. It's, it hasn't been abrogated with the second verse, but it, the meaning has changed. So what this means is now that this verse says that water is dry. Okay, so that's the new meaning. Water is dry. So you read the verse and says water is wet and go, Islam is scientific. Oh my gosh, Islam has realized that water is wet. <laughs> Subhanallah. Whatever. Okay. However, as far as the scholars know, and you don't, that verse now means that water is dry. 
but they don't tell you this because the the mafhum has changed but not the mantuk the wording remains identical but the understanding of what it actually means despite what it says is very very different this is something that remains i think closely guarded i haven't found very much about this but keep this in mind so there are verses that will throw at you that can mean something totally contradictory to what the words actually say your comment there thaddeus yeah you know uh uh I'm sure that most Muslims are not aware of this, but they inadvertently use it when they tell us that, you know, well, you don't understand the, the meaning of that verse, which seems to plainly tell us something. Uh, yes. They may It may not actually have changed, but they'll say, uh, it, it doesn't matter what the verse says, only matters what I think it should say. Uh, of course, they're not qualified to actually make that judgment, but nonetheless, it's that kind of idea, that the words on the paper seem to say one thing, but you can have a different, totally different idea in your mind. Correct. Right, so the wording of the verse remains the same, but the meaning of the verse has changed. Keep that in mind, okay? Uh, just a brief diversion. Don't confuse the term salafia with salaf. So the phrase that was revealed after it implies that Mansuk ruling, the ruling that is abrogated, must precede the Nasik ruling in time. This also implies that Nasik could only occur in the lifetime of the Prophet since after his death no new rulings from the Quran or Sunnah are going to be revealed. Uh, Hillside, that's a very good point. They do change the meaning as they please over time. And I would assume that they simply wrote the Hadith to suit their political ends as they wanted. Now, the Salaf and the term Nask, he goes on to say that the first person to limit the meaning of the word Nask to apply to abrogation was Imam Shafi. Shafi did lots of funny business with the Quran and with, these, with the Sunnah, lots of funny business, right? And he was the guy that basically standardized the Islamic law, the Fiqh. So in his famous treaty on Usul al-Fiqh and Tatul al um, do you understand he wrote two Arisalas? He wrote one when he was younger, and about 30 years later, he wrote another one. So the first one cancels the second one. Uh, sorry, the second one cancels the first one. The second one's more complete. And in fact, this, the second one has also itself been basically abrogated because all of its teachings have been absorbed into other books amongst those Reliance on the Traveler, the Umdat al-Sarik and others. So understand that his books, if you read them, are actually quite basic. They, they're not exactly scholarly mountainous. No, they're not major scholarly or towering scholarly works anymore. They're considered fairly basic today. So when coming across statements from the scholars of the first three generations, that claim that a particular verse was abrogated by another verse, this cannot be immediately taken as an example of Nusk. So now he's saying, now remember, the first three generations of scholars are the best of Islam, the best of Muslims. The following generations are all watered down, right? Because Muhammad very clearly says that the, the first generation is the best generation, and the one after them, and the one after them, and after that, no one is going to be a pure, good Muslim anymore. But now we're being told by the scholars that actually those early Muslims didn't know what they were talking about. Your thoughts, Thaddeus? Well, you know, we hear that from common Muslims all the time, that the only expert on Islam is, is themselves, apparently. Whatever you read from someone else, you know, you point him to, say, Yasser Qadi, for example, and they're like, well, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Only I know what Islam teaches. Yeah, exactly. So understand, so they say that Nasik meant something different back in the day. So they meant the word in a completely different context and the way that they mean it is different to the way we mean it today and so on. And this has been one of the greatest causes of confusion with regards to the number of Nasik and Mansik verses in the Quran, as shall be elaborated upon, he tells us. Excellent. So now he talks of books written on the subject. So after the subject of Tafsir, understand Tafsir, as we all know, are interpretations, right? Exegesis. Literally, it means interpretation, but these are the scholarly exegesis of the verses of the Quran. Understand that hadith also have tafsir. You just don't know what they are because most of them have not been translated. The most famous one is the tafsir of Bukhari by a man called Askalani. Right? So understand, so when you read tafsir, you need to find the tafsir of the hadith as well. Anyway, the topic that has been given the most attention in the study of the Quran is that of abrogation. Some of the more famous authors have written on this topic are these guys, and Ibn Hanbal, the founder of the Hanbali school of fiqh, Abu Dawud and Tirmidhi, both of Sunan fame, right? That's from the Kitab al-Sitta, and um, the Sunan Abu Dawud, and Abu Ubaid al-Qasim al-Salam, whose book is considered the best classical discussion of the subject. So very often we're not aware of actually who the best books are. We're aware of the most common ones, but you know we're not necessarily aware of actually the most scholarly ones. Now, the most thorough discussion of the topic of Nusk written in this era is the book Blah, Blah, Blah by Mustafa Zaid, 
In it, the author discusses every verse that has ever been claimed to have been abrogated and offers his own conclusion. Now, do bear in mind that these scholars can have any conclusion they like. It's fine. You can ignore them totally and completely, simply because you can go to the Sharia and read exactly what's not abrogated. Because the Sharia will tell you flat out, this verse is valid, that verse is not. Because if it's not in the Sharia, it's not valid, bluntly. Any comments? So before we move on, I have a couple audience comments. Uh, KL says this reminds me of Marxism, changing the definitions to grab power and influence. And I'd say, I'd say we did a, a series on Bilal Phillips's um, Dawah manual, and we see the, the same kind of thing, him constantly changing definitions of words. Um, for example, he claimed that pedophilia meant paying a minor for sex. Uh, <laughs> that was the most egregious, but he lots of important words he redefined in, such, uh, in subtle ways or dramatic ways, such that he can say one thing Sound, give a meaning to you and have a completely different meaning to him and so then in his mind he's not lying um, lord likes to say that uh, islam is a religion not of priests but, but a religion of lawyers and i think that's yeah. exactly right it's all about arguing over the details you know you got uh, all these verses they seem to say one thing but you can't accept what they they say so you find a way to change that well, how do you do that? Well, you can't change the words, so you argue over the mm -hmm. definitions of those words. Agreed, yeah. Uh, Victor Rodriguez, R Rodriguez said something very funny. Some holes have been abrogated by other holes, bigger and better or similar. <laughs> 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 Hysterical. Um, yeah. Hillslide said, so Sharia is more important than the opinions of the scholars. Now, understand the Sharia is the opinion of the scholars. Ultimately, it is what the scholars say that Allah meant, and what Muhammad meant, right? But in terms of the actual physical words, what they implied and what they did, right? This includes also the actions of the of this, the followers of Muhammad, right? So his Sahaba. So the Sharia is the final say by the scholars of what the Quran meant, what was implied, what was stated, what was intended, right? So that's that's that. Um, so now. Yasser Qadi goes on to tell us <laughs> that, no, okay, well, so the proof of Nusk, let's look at this. The vast majority of scholars have upheld the validity of Nusk, right? So the vast majority of scholars. Now, understand some scholars are just completely irrelevant. They can, they can waffle on as much as they like. They're not important. And Muslims will love to show you these scholars because a lot of what happened, just like within the, um, within the Talmud, there was a lot of debate by the scholars. So they'll bring up a comment which was contradictory, but this is just part of the debate, the ongoing debate between the scholars. It's not necessarily a final ruling. And a sheikh, like Yasser Qari, can make a, a ruling, he can make a fatwa, but this is not a binding fatwa. That's very different. The Sharia are binding fatwa. So now, only some Shia and Mutazli scholars, such as blah, 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 have raised objections concerning Nasq. Abu Muslim claims that while it is not inconceivable that Nusk can occur, there are no rulings to demonstrate it. However, he says that al Jauzi mentioned Abu Muslim was the first scholar to deny the validity of a Nusk, and he went against the Ijma of all the scholars before him. The Ijma is the ultimate arbiter of what is the what the definitions are, what the meanings are within Islam. Right? So we are told here by Qadi that Abu Muslim's view has been aptly refuted since the Quran and Sunnah is very explicit in the occurrence of Nusk. The Quran says, and also, by the way, Ijma, to re in law, in Islamic law, the third and in practice, the most important of the sources of legal knowledge. It is the unanimous agreement of the community. Now, when they say the community, they don't mean the Muslims. They mean the scholars, right? The ulama on a regulation imposed by Allah. It is the unanimous doctrine and opinion of the recognized religious authorities. And well, Abdul in the comments is not a recognized religious authority. Right, <clears throat> so Abu Muslim did not deny the validity. Now, oddly enough, he says this man was refuted because he denied Nusk, he denied abrogation, but he was refuted. And he goes on to say, Abu Muslim did not deny the validity of what has been defined as Nusk. So in other words, he agreed that there is such a thing as abrogation. He just maybe decided, well, look, it wasn't actually occurring, right? So, but for him, in every Mansuk was specified that the Nusk had been meant only for a limited time. Now, just like the covenants of God in the Bible, these were for limited time, basically limited to a time, a place, a geography, right? A person. And here they're saying that, well, 
this was for a limited time, but of course the Sharia is eternal, right? So he held the view, blah, blah, blah. So just a little point of debate that was going on. I'll actually skip over that. So Abu Muslim's view has been refuted since the Quran and Sunnah is explicit. So, because the Quran says, we do not abrogate a ruling or cause it to be forgotten, except that we substitute something better or similar. Allah is indeed capable of all things. In another verse, Allah says, and when we change a verse in the Quran in place of another, and Allah knows best what he sends down, they say, you, O Muhammad, are but a forger. Nay, but most of them are ignorant. That's Quran 16, 101. And Kaidi tells us, okay, so I'll get to your question in a moment. Okay, so actually, let me get to your question, Veronica. So, the question is, does it mean there's no agreement when there's no such thing as, where there is such a thing as abrogation? No, there is very much agreement. If you go to the Sharia manuals, right? If you go to the, to the fiqh, it is very explicit. It is discussed in detail. For instance, for someone to become a judge, to become a sheikh, to become a qadi, qadi means judge in Islam, right? So to become a qadi, you have to know all of the abrogated hadith and the abrogated verses of the Quran. It is compulsory for a Qadi to know this. This is knowledge he must possess to make his judgments. He has to understand this. So this knowledge is given to him. He studies for years to do so. So understand they do know. The idea that there is no, because they have the ijma, they have the consensus. That's the majoritarian consensus of what, of what anything means. Muslims love to tell us that there's confusion, but if there were confusion, no one would know what's going on. In my opinion, is as valid as, um, as, as Yahya, who has no idea what he's talking about, right, is just as valid as your neighbor. It's just as anybody can make up whatever he likes, in which case, how can you say that ISIS is wrong and ISIS are not Muslims? So yes, there is a very clear consensus. They just don't want you to know this because they never want to be pinned down. If you can pin them down to an exact meaning, that means that they suddenly lose power because you can say, well, X, you know, one plus one is equal to two. But you know, in Islam, one plus one is equal to whatever they need it to be on that moment. So there is no confusion. However, they just pretend that there is confusion. They say the scholars disagree. Well, they actually agree well enough for the machine to run. So, so don't don't bother lying. Yes, the, that is. Uh, yeah, I was going to say Shabir Ali is a, a good example of a Muslim who takes this approach, and and claims that there is no abrogation because it allows him to take whatever verses he likes and you know mix them up and kind of come up with his own uh, interpretation. He, he uses a lot of um, mental gymnastics to get to the conclusion he wants. And then he says, well, this is exactly what we have to do. This is the only way to read a text. Um, and he comes to a lot of uh, non-conventional, uh, non-Islamic, non you might even say, interpretations because of that, uh, which is why he's not that well respected in Islamic circles, even though we tend to think of him as the best Muslim apologist. That is true. I think he may well just be a propagandist because at one point people were saying, you know, Yasser Qadi is a moderate. He's the guy that's trying to change Islam, reform Islam. And my stand was, no, the man is fully, entirely orthodox. Look at his behavior recently. The man is completely orthodox. He's following the doctrine of the Sharia to the letter. He's not deviating. The man is orthodox, as fully orthodox as it gets. Now, he goes on to say here in these verses, the concept of Nas is very explicit. That was Quran 2, 106 and Quran 16, 101. He holds that up as proof. So apart from these verses, there are numerous instances in the Quran of Sunnah when Nas has been mentioned explicitly. For example, a Muslim in battle was prohibited from fleeing from the enemy if you were faced with 10 enemy soldiers, a ratio of 1 to 10. So if you had 10 in front of you, well, you were obliged to fight. Allah then revealed, now Allah has lightened your burden for he knows that there is a weakness in you. So if there are 100 of you, they shall overcome 200. So the ratio was changed to 2 to 1. Quran 8.66. This is a contradiction between these verses, so there has to be abrogation. The ratio was reduced to one Muslim for every two non-Muslim soldiers. The Nusk is now explicit. So let's continue. With regards to Nusk and the Sunnah, the classic hadith that is quoted is the Prophet's statement, I used to forbid you to visit graves, but now you may freely do so, for they remind you of death. Once again, the occurrence of Nas is explicit. And here he speaks of a hadith collection narrated by Al-Hakim that we've never heard of. I've never seen this guy, never heard of it. That same hadith, hadith it was narrated, blah, 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 is in Sunan Ibn Majah, Nasai, 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 and Malik. Right. So it actually is found in other collections. Now, why would they bring up, not the Kitab al-Sitta, not the six canonical hadith collections, but why would they bring up this one that we've never heard of? Clearly, these ones are also authoritative. We're just unaware of them. 
So the conditions for NASC, so contradictory rulings, despite being canceled, remain valid. That's why they can throw them at you because the conditions for the implementation of that particular law has not taken place. So therefore they still kind of hold on to the old law in the meantime. There are a number of conditions that blah, blah, blah have laid down in order to substantiate a claim, right? So NASC, one of the reasons given is that NASC is only called as, is called only as a last resort, since the concept of NASC implies discarding a ruling for another one, as long as both rulings can be applied, NASC is not resorted to. So in other words, Allah can do contradictories. Your thoughts there, Thanis? Yeah, th that's very interesting uh, because in my last live stream, there was a, a Muslim in the chat, um, a voice in the dark, who was getting upset at us for saying that God couldn't do contradictory things. He was saying God could do anything. Uh, yeah. And this was his explanation for how, um, in particular, Adam could be 90 feet tall. It's like, it doesn't matter if it violates the, the laws of physics. It doesn't matter if God has no reason to do it whatsoever. He can do anything. He can create a square circle right. if he wants. Exactly. Because our God, the Christian God, is Logos. Right? He is reason. Right? And reason flows from him. Truth flows from him. So Logos is truth. Logos is logical. Allah is not Logos. Allah is not reason. Allah is will. Allah can do anything. Allah can do contradictories. As you know, Allah is a makr. He can lie. So you know that God cannot lie. Right. We know that God cannot do evil because God cannot do contradictories. That's within logos, within logic, you have you have non-contradictory logic. And this is this is the nature of God. Whereas Allah can do anything. He can lie, he can cheat, he can do evil. Right. So understand. So we are dealing with two very, very different concepts of reality, of God, of the world. So the more important conditions, as it says, are as follows. The most important conditions for NASC to have occurred is that the two rulings must directly contradict each other. So, hey, we have now contradiction in Islam and contradiction within the Quran, such that both rulings cannot be applied at the same time. So now people will say, well, but the Old Testament says, yeah, but th that's 3,000 years ago. Why, why are you going back 3,000 years to find something to throw at me? That was a long time ago, and we have flush toilets and electricity now. Times have changed a little bit, you know what I'm saying? So, so yeah, things are a little different now. And those covenants are abrogated because those covenants are canceled. It's not like both are valid. No, that was valid then. It's no longer valid now. Those times have changed, right? Those were valid for a different person, different time, different place. So, but here within the Quran, which claims to be eternal, the Bible doesn't make the same claims as the Quran. So it claims to be eternal, right? And valid for all time. But now you've got one that says, um, kill them. And one that says, don't kill them. Well, um... Um, um. So there exists no way to reconcile them. So there is no reconciliation. So when there exists no other way to explain the two rulings, then you have abrogation. Um, jump in if ever you want to say anything. So for the claim of Nas to be substantiated, a later ruling must have repealed an earlier one. So Allah made mistakes and he had to change. So he tells us here, you've got two 187 and 866, which are, which cancel each other, right? So, and also he speaks very importantly, and he actually goes on at length about this in his book. I recommend you do download the book. Okay, and you do read it, you do look through it. He speaks of the Meccan and Medinan verses because he goes to, to great lengths to teach the Muslims who read this that all the verses about being nice to the Christians. This is when he gets to someone asked about Surah 9. Yeah, Yahya, your holy father has put evil spirit in the mouth of his prophets to deceive others. Which language is he speaking? Like, I. I looks like English, but I couldn't understand a word he said. Well, like, you know, maybe it's one of those cases where the plain meaning of the words is the exact opposite and uh, oh, the meaning has been abrogated or something like that. The muff whom in the Muntuk. Oh my gosh. The man's a scholar. You know, he's, he's actually an artist because no one can understand him. So, yeah. So what we have now is um, he, he goes to great lengths to explain that the, the, the verses about being nice to the Christians are all from Mecca. All the verses about killing the Christians happen in Medina. And he says, hold on, we've got to understand that the later part of Muhammad's life is the more valid part, right? This abrogates 
or most of what happens in this part. And this is when he goes in to explain verse 9-5. And he says, well, obviously verse 9-5 abrogates all the previous things, except it doesn't, but it does, except it doesn't. And of course, lots and lots of verses were abrogated in the Quran, but nothing, you know, we can't really prove. It's very hard to know. You know, it's not really possible. We can't tell. It's not, you know, probably none, maybe one verse, maybe three, all of them actually, because 9-5 actually abrogates the... Just read his book. It makes no. Just read the, read to the end of the chapter on abrogation and see if it makes sense to you how he concludes, because it's it's just nonsense. So the narrations concerning blah blah blah. In other words, it must be known for certain that Nasik ruling was was revealed after. Excellent. So both the Nasik and Mansik rulings must originate in the Quran and Sunnah. We've got that. It is not possible for Ijma to occur against an explicit command in the Quran and Sunnah. So the consensus must follow apparently what happens in the Quran and the Sunnah, and Allah has the right, now notice, this is very important, Allah has the right to abrogate any command that originated from him, right? So Allah can, can contradict himself, either in the Quran or through the tongue of Muhammad. So Muhammad can abrogate anything Allah said. This is make This makes Muhammad effectively more powerful than Allah, or as powerful as Allah. Let me provide you. Um, yeah, yeah, how about you talk about um, Mr. Kadi's own book here? And, uh, you know, let's talk about that because I know you're trying to distract because that's all you've got. You know that I know Islam way better than you ever will. And that uh, you have no scholarly knowledge of your own actual Sharia and fiqh. You have no idea what your scholars know. So, yeah, moving on. So, Lloyd de Young, Shalom. Hi there. Hi, Dragana. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Waiting for him to run to the Bible, he already did. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay. So going on. Now, Nas can only occur within the Quran and Sunnah. Okay. And he repeats this multiple times, as you'll notice. He goes on at length about this. Therefore, the Nasik ruling can come only from the Quran or Sunnah. And the Nasik ruling can be found in the Quran or Sunnah. Right. So the Mansik ruling can come from the Quran. Or, so hold on. The abrogate thing verse can come from the Quran or the Sunnah. Okay. So. So, yeah, so the Quran abrogating the Quran. So he gives us, sorry, I, I just messed it up. But anyway, um, he gives us four conditions for how abrogation can work. So one, the Quran can abrogate the Quran. He gives us here verse 2, 240, abrogated by this one, right? So, and those of you who die and leave behind their wives should bequeath them a year's maintenance and residence without turning them out. That's Quran 2, 240. Later on, this ruling was abrogated by, and those of you who die and leave behind their wives, their wives should wait four months and 10 days. That's 2, 234. So we have a clear example he gives us of abrogation from the Quran in the Quran, right? Then the Quran can abrogate the Sunnah, because don't forget, some of these histories of Muhammad, we're not talking about the Hadith here specifically. They kind of make that very confusing. They don't want to make that clear to us. So, oh, oh, Yahya's talking nonsense again, right? So That's Quran, okay, I put him in timeout. <laughs> yeah, sweet. So what you have is you have the Sunnah, which is really the biographies of Muhammad, right? The Gospels of Muhammad, tried to, which basically are a ripoff of the Gospels of Jesus. So you've got now, Muhammad was saying things in the Quran, and also people are writing stories about him. So the stories, the tra traditions, the legends, the folk tales, the fairy tales, etc., etc., of Muhammad can the Quran can actually abrogate those things as well. There's these external secondary sources, right? So the majority of scholars have agreed to the validity of this type of Nasq. An example is, is the changing of the Qibla. It says here that the Muslims used to pray towards Jerusalem, but eventually the Quran revealed that the direction of the Qibla was Mecca, right? So the initial Qibla was based on the Sunnah, interestingly, and the abrogation came down in the Quran. This incident is clear proof that the Quran can abrogate the Sunnah. The third example of how abrogation functions, the Sunnah can abrogate the Quran. And here he says it to us. A mutawatir hadith can abrogate the Quran. A mutawatir hadith can abrogate the Quran. And he says this is further subdivided into two categories. But now we hear direct from Masjid Yasir Qadi that hadiths can abrogate the Quran. So this was allowed by Malik, right? by Hanifa, that's the Hanafi school, which is the largest school of fiqh in the world, right? Islamic fiqh, Islamic law. And it's the one that most Muslims follow. And of the opinions of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, right? So that's three of the schools and both are forms of revelation from Allah. And since both give indisputable knowledge, they may abrogate one another. So now he is placing, now of course the man who made that law, understand that the man who made that law, that the Sunnah is equivalent to the Quran was Shafi. So in other words, all four scholars of the major schools, the four, all four inerrant scholars, all four masters of Islamic law, all agree 
that the Sunnah, the Hadith, can abrogate the Quran. And Yasir Qadi tells us this. Uh, your thoughts, and, Thaddeus? Yeah, I was just going to point out that any Muslim who prays five times a day, whether they realize it or not, also follows this idea that the Sunnah can abrogate the Quran, since the Quran says to pray three times a day, and it's only the Hadith that tell them to pray five times correct. a day. Correct. That is a very good point. That is correct. And Yasir Qadi actually goes out of his way to avoid some of these more controversial issues. He actually drops a lot of interesting things. So an example of Mutawatir Hadith abrogating the Quran is the verse concerning bequest to heirs. It is described for you. When many of you, it is prescribed for you. When any of you approaches death and he has wealth, then he makes a bequest to his parents and next of kin, 2180. This ruling was abrogated by the Hadith of the Prophet, which said there is no bequest to an heir. So here we have this. So a Hadith of the Prophet, right? A hadith Khudzi, I think they call this, actually abrogates the Quran directly, which means that they put Muhammad's word ahead of that of Allah by saying that they honor Muhammad by making his word equivalent to that of Allah. So yeah, if, if that's not blasphemy, if that's not, um, you know, if that's not shirk, I don't know, but uh, your, your thoughts that is? Yeah, you know, it's pretty crazy. Basically, the only thing that matters is when it was revealed chronologically. Uh, we often see in comments, Muslims say, hey, when, you know, we quote some hadith that they don't like, they say, well, the hadith can't violate the Quran. Even if they're Sahih hadith, you can throw them out if they yes. violate the Quran. And um, not that the they hadith that we quote normally contradict with the Quran. They normally agree with it. That's just an excuse. But even if they disagreed, that wouldn't be a sufficient reason to throw out the Hadith. The Hadith might have been revealed later, so it might be the final word on the matter. Very, very true. Very well said. And not only that, it doesn't have to be a Sahih Hadith either. Like, you know, for some reason, I always forget. What's the second category of Hadith? I always remember Da'if, Maudu, and Hassan. Hassan, Hassan. that's it. Yes. Good grief. I, for some reason, that word just always drops out of my head. So... It doesn't have to be a Sahih Hadith. Basically, you can have Hadith that are not Sahih that can actually abrogate the Quran. That's very interesting. So they can say, well, it's not Sahih. Well, it doesn't matter. To the scholars, it doesn't matter. A Mutawatir Hadith can abrogate the Quran. This was allowed by blah, 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 right? So he says that. But he says, an Ahad Hadith abrogates the Quran too. He says, many scholars did not allow this since they reason the Quran is Mutawatir and provides indisputable knowledge of authenticity, whereas an Ahad Hadith does not provide indisputable knowledge. This view, although representing the majority opinion, is not necessarily the correct one. Oh, that's convenient. Shakiti <laughs> discusses this question in detail and concludes that an Ahad Hadith can abrogate the Quran. Such an occurrence is rare, but it can, and he does give the condition it must be known for certain that the Ahad narration occurred after the verse. So fine, if the, if the Hadith occurred after the verse, then well, it can. An example of this, according to a Shikiti, is the prohibition of the flesh of domesticated donkeys. Hadith never ever abrogate. Well, we have a scholar in the chat, people. The final word of Islam. Obviously, as you as you know, um, <laughs> Al Azhar University, the world's finest Islamic seminary, phones Yahya whenever they have a question. When there's a little bit of confusion, they give Yahya a call, and he advises them. And um, as we know, he's a legend in his own mind at this point. So, and, and b before you move on, I, I would like to ask Yaya where he confronted Yasser Qadi. We're reading, we're, we're not telling you our opinion. We're reading Yasser Qadi's opinion. Yasser Qadi has, uh, he, he spent four years at the top Islamic university in the Middle East, and then another four years uh, or so. In, I, actually, I think it's five and five, but whatever, around four five years. Five to seven, five to at, seven at, years. Yeah. At, at Yale, uh, one of the top universities in the West. So he's been studying Islam at two of the universe, top universities in the world for, you know, 10 years, and then he's been working in academia ever since. Uh, so I'd like to know where you confronted his opinion, where you got a peer-reviewed article published about how Yasser Qadi was wrong about what Islam teaches. And until then, your opinion is as worthless as it seems to be. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much, um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's completely worthless. Um, yeah, it's interesting that Yahya has never confronted, as you say, Yasser Qadi. He's never put out anything that confronts and directly contradicts Yasser Qadi, that he has never taken the time to study this. Um, yeah, this would be very interesting because it's quite obvious that Yahya is simply running interference for Islam. He is simply being a good 
Islamic apologist by causing confusion. He is very much an orthodox believer in Islam. So I don't think that anything he says is actually true because he defends Islam. And if he's unwilling to go against Yasser Qadi, that means he's following the orthodox tenets of Islam that says that the Muslim must never, ever fight with the Muslim in words, you know, would never disagree with him and never embarrass him in public. But yeah, fine. If, uh, if, Kai, if uh, Yahya doesn't do that, then we know that Yahya is fully, fully orthodox and he's simply putting on a show for everyone else. And so it must be known for certain that the Ahad narration occurred after, right, of, after the verse. An example of this is the prohibition of the flesh, eating the flesh of domesticated donkeys. This occurred during the Battle of Haibad and this, as such abrogated the previous ruling that it was allowed by the understanding of 1645. So Imam Shafi did not allow the Quran to abrogate the Sunnah, nor the Sunnah to abrogate the Quran. He felt the Quran did only abrogate the Quran the same with the Sunnah. He doesn't actually give us any evidence for this. And we know that this is not true because from the previous slide, it's very, very obvious that Shafi actually wrote a lot of the rulings that the others agreed with. So therefore, Shafi clearly was in agreement. So, so Yasir Qadi isn't being entirely honest with us. And we need to get a second opinion on, on a lot of what he says. And he speaks of the Sunnah, abrogates the Sunnah. So Hadith can abrogate Hadith, right? <laughs> Moses should have left them with 500. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Uh, yeah. Yes, thank you for that super chat. Uh, Philippians 2.10. Imagine if Moses left them with the 50 prayers piece in the Middle East. Because, of course, the Hadith say that uh, originally they were going to have to pray 50 prayers a day. And then uh, the... It, this back and forth happened until Moses got it down to five prayers a day. Yeah, yeah of course, Yahya is a, is a hypocrite because Yahya wants to contradict us for reading, actually literally reading right out of the Sharia. But when Yasir Qadi, who has an audience of millions, right, an audience of millions, Yasir Qadi is like, well, you know, I just rely on myself. I didn't follow Yasir Qadi, you know, I didn't, I didn't go argue with him because, because, because you're a hypocrite, right? Um, this man is teaching, supposedly, according to your own lies, false Islam to millions. Why don't you confront him? If he is teaching millions and millions of people false Islam, why aren't you dealing with this? You're like, well, you know, it's, it's, it's okay for Yasir Qadi to lie, but it's wrong for Thaddeus and Lloyd to read straight out of my own books that say exactly what Islam says. So it's not okay for Lloyd and Thaddeus to tell the truth, literally reading off the page, but it's okay for Yasir Qadi to lie to millions of Muslims. What kind of uh, hypocrite are you exactly, Yahya? Please let us know in the comments. So, um, yeah, please let us know, because I see you're not answering me. You know, you're avoiding that, Yahya. So, moving on. So, this was allowed by all. Now, the Sunnah abrogates the Sunnah. So, you don't have a list of which Hadith abrogated the Hadith. So, you don't know. When they give you a bunch of Hadith, how do you know those are valid? How do you know those weren't abrogated by later Hadith? You don't. And they don't want you to know this, because they, they want to keep you in the dark. Right? Like a mushroom. And we all know what that saying is. So understand, so this category is further subdivided, but it is agreed upon by the scholars. Okay, your comments, Thaddeus? Oh, we have an audience comment here that I was about to pull up. I accidentally scrolled past it. Uh, I'm, I'm not, oh, there it is. How can the words of men abrogate the words of Allah? How weak is this false god, Allah? Exactly. You know, that's a good point that he apparently didn't reveal the right information. He had to rely on Muhammad to come and correct him later on. Yeah, Yahya said he doesn't have time to deal with Qadi. You know, he doesn't have time. It's like he would, you know, he would. But he, he <laughs> that, that's awesome. You know. But he has he has time to get in, in our chats here. And I see him on all kinds of Christian channels all day, every day even very small channels that only have a few hundred subscribers, he has enough time to go to their channel. But yeah. it, but if it's uh, Yasser Qadi and his uh, vast, vast influence, you know, he's probably one of the five most influential Muslims in the world, uh, and he says, I don't have time for him. Makes yeah. no sense. Yeah, I guess, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, he must be really, really busy chasing the little small fry to not go after the whales, right? I guess you've got a really small fishing rod and a tiny, tiny hook. And, yeah, uh, DHC is saying that he's looking forward to when the Yaya version of the Quran comes out because we only have these insufficient hafs so far. We're waiting for the Yaya revision. Yeah. 
you know, I mean, honestly, it's just a joke. So the Sunnah abrogates the Sunnah, right? Now notice also in the previous line, they mentioned here that another scholar also said, Al Albani also said, Ahad Hadith can abrogate the Quran. This is a secondary level of authority of Hadith. It's not a primary Hadith, right? So it can. So you've got scholars that said, yes, it can happen and it does happen. So a mutawa he summarizes a mutawatir hadith can abrogate a mutawatir hadith. An ahad hadith can abrogate another ad ahad hadith. A mutawatir hadith can abrogate an ahad hadith. And an ahad hadith can abrogate a mutawatir hadith. So a lower authority hadith, one with a, a lower degree of authentication, can abrogate one with a higher degree of authentication, according to Yasukari. So hadith do abrogate hadith, and hadith do abrogate the Quran. And the first three categories, he says, are agreed upon by all scholars. The last category is held by those who allow for it. Okay. And yeah, so so this does can and does happen. Yeah. So now so from Islamic law and the reliance. Now this is not a very long presentation. I'll probably get three slides for another presentation I'll show you. But let's have a look at what the Islamic law actually says so that we can verify a little bit of what Qadi says. And um, not everything he says is necessarily accurate. Right? There are things that he talks about if you read his book that I would completely disagree with. Because you go to the Sharia and it says something completely different. But abrogation, nusk of revealed rulings by others. So in this Sharia, they call it supersession, to supersede. Okay, so the Sharia definitely speaks about it. And they call it supersession. Okay, so they speak of supersession, to replace or to supersede, nusk. Now they speak of mansuk, a Quranic ruling type. See also supersession. So clearly the Sharia speaks of it multiple times. These are just a few references to it that clearly exists within Islamic law. It is a facet of Islamic law, which is permanent for all time. Nasik, Quranic ruling, supersession. So you have references, O22.1, right? Now supersession, Nasik, of all religions by Islam. Section 08.7 in the Reliance. Now we are being told that Islam supersedes, okay? all other religions, right? So Islam is the nasik of all religions. All religions are mansuk. Islam makes nasik all religions. Now, Christianity. What is very interesting when they speak about this, they speak of the supersession of Christianity by Islam in section W4.3 to W4.4 in the Sharia law. And it also speaks of belief in the, in the validity. So for a Muslim to have belief in the validity of Islam is unbelief. It is kufr. Obviously, we know what that's apostasy, which is the death penalty. So belief in the validity of unbelief uh, is, is unbelief, right? Muslims are not allowed to believe in Christianity as a valid religion. Defined in section 08.7 and W4.1. Also, they speak of super, supersession by Islam. And then, of course, they speak of the delusions of Christians. Christians, delusions of, section S1.2. And when they speak of the delusions of Christians, and this is being polite, so if this is being mild, you've got to read through section W4, it'll shock the, the socks off you. They speak of the delusions of Christians that we have the delusion of forgiveness, that we have the delusion of grace. That's why Yas, uh, Yahya constantly talks about, oh, you think you can do whatever you like, you can sin all you want and just go, okay, God, I've been a Satanist, I've been evil, I've been diddling kitties like Muhammad, and I changed my mind two minutes before I die, just to save my soul, off to heaven, off, all is good. That's the kind of idea that Yahya wants to push on us, of course, because he doesn't understand forgiveness. But they believe that we have a delusion that we are forgiven because they said that we have a completely wrong idea of the grace and forgiveness of God, and thus we are deluded. We are deluded people. Uh, your thoughts on that point, that is? Well, you know, we, we've seen today that abrogation is based primarily solely on chronology. It doesn't matter how reliable something is. Obviously, if it was very unreliable, it couldn't abrogate anything. But if it's reasonably reliable, it can abrogate something that is supposedly the infallible word of God. For example, you know, a Hassan Hadith that is not Mudawadar can and abrogate the Quran. Um, so it's not surprising that Islam would say that Islam abrogates Christianity. It doesn't have to be reliable. It just has to come later. That's basically all you have to know about it, that it came later, and no one would deny that. Uh, and therefore, it is newer and superior. But I wonder how they would feel about uh, a Mormon saying that Mormonism has abrogated Islam. Yeah, well, Mormonism has abrogated Islam. So they'll be happy to know that, you know. 
Um, now, they say that does Allah condemn the Jews and the Christians for anything besides being this way when he says, they grasp at the paltry things of this low life and say, we shall be forgiven in Quran 7, 169. So apparently we are deluded when we think that we shall be forgiven. So Islam, remember, calls Christianity the deen al batal al batal means the false, the vain, the worthless. Our prayers and our words fall like dust at our feet. Allah does not hear them, you know, according to them. So we are not heard. Our prayers are worthless. And um, al batal is also one of the names of Satan. So we are now a religion of Satan. It has been corrupted and it's become the religion of Satan. We are followers of Satan and they must destroy us. Tafsir Ibn Kathir on Quran 7, 169 says they wish and hope from Allah while deceiving themselves. We have no forgiveness. We have no grace. We need to follow the works of Islam the way Muhammad did it. We need to follow the Sunnah. Then we will find salvation. But of course, we know that Muhammad himself said he doesn't know if he will find salvation. He has no idea where he's going. He's just a warner and he has no idea himself. The Quran says that, but of course the Quran doesn't say what it says. It says what the scholars say it says. Yeah. Any comments from you there, Thaddeus? Yep, no comments. Okay, so I'm going to move over quickly just to go through a handful of slides. So, so that basically wraps me up here, but I'm going to go through a few words from a different set of slides. Now, Al-Ghazali, of course, Al-Ghazali is not in the same category as Yahya, of course, we know that Al-Ghazali is the most revered, respected Islamic scholar after Muhammad. He's the most highly ranked Islamic scholar ever after Muhammad himself. And so he wrote most of the doctrine, or rather he formalized most of the doctrine that we now know as the Sharia and the Fiqh. So he said that the prophets are not immune to errors in judgments. Now, what's interesting is that the Sharia teaches, though, that Christians are blameworthy we are corrupt because we accuse the prophets of not being perfect. We accuse the prophets of sin. We accuse the prophets of doing wrong. And therefore, we have sinned against God. We have violated God's law. We have basically spat in God's face by saying that the messengers of God were not perfect. Uh, just your thoughts on that point, that is. Yeah, you know, this is uh, one of those many instances where <clears throat> Muslim belief and the Quran seem to be in contradiction since the Quran repeatedly tells Muhammad to uh, ask for forgiveness for his sins. Uh, it says that all the prophets forgot things. It says that um, all the prophets made mistakes. And then we get this Islamic doctrine that no prophet can ever make a mistake, no prophet can ever sin, and especially Muhammad can't. It's a very interesting contradiction. Yeah, so Muhammad is perfect. Of course, the Quran in P75.2, so not the Quran, the reliance, right? The Sharia teaches in section P75.2 that Muhammad is perfect and that you must love Muhammad more than your life, your family, your wife, your child, everything. Muhammad must be held above everything in your life. And of course, we get from the top scholar of Islam that Muhammad made mistakes. Al-Ghazali wrote in Deliverance from Error, says the prophets and religious leaders, okay, referred to to men to exercise of personal judgment. And because we are humans, we made mistakes that men might err. The apostle of Allah, Allah's blessings, blah, 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 even said, I judge by externals, but Allah undertakes to judge by the hearts of men. This means, and he interprets this for us because you know, the miracle of reinterpretation always, I judge according to the most probable opinion resulting from the witness statements, but they may err about the matter. The prophets had no way to be safe from error involving personal judgments. This is the finest scholar of Islam after Muhammad. The prophets had no way to be safe from error involving personal judgments. How then can anyone else? And he goes on to say that even Muhammad did not make perfect judgments, that Muhammad made mistakes. Abbas Aga, your thoughts there. So you, we're reading directly off the books of your top scholars, the words of your absolute best scholars of Islam, and we are hot air. So are you calling your own ulama liars? Are you saying that the four imams are liars? Or are you the liar? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, he, he says that what we're saying is nonsense, that we're just filled with hot air. But in fact, those aren't our words. So you just called one of the top scholars the top, of Islam clueless. The top scholar. The, the top scholar of Islam, utterly clueless. And then he has no idea what he's talking about. So um, if, if you're going to tell me that Islam's best scholars have no clue what Islam is, uh, well, fine. Thank you for proving why no one should want to join Islam if no one knows what it is. 
yeah, if the scholars are just hot air, if the scholars are wrong, I mean, you know, which uh, which which mosque do you run, Mr. YouTube comment section Abdul? Because clearly you know everything. Does um do does the ulama phone you for advice when they're lost and they're stuck? No, they don't. No, they don't. Hey. Uh, and I, I'd like to, Abbas to explain his follow-up comment here. He says, you're nitpicking. Um, we, d we, we literally read the words of the scholar. We didn't read say, we did we, we didn't. We read an entire chapter. Is that nitpicking? <laughs> we didn't even provide our own commentary before you, you told us that we were full of hot air. We literally had given none of our own commentary. And you're saying we're nitpicking the words uh, of the scholar. Uh, I, I don't get it. I, I I think that you probably didn't understand what we were reading and you thought we were giving our own opinion and now you've been caught and you are just coming up with excuses. Where did Muhammad say that he's not sure that he's not going to paradise? Clearly you don't know your own scholarly works and besides you want to simply distract from the topic at hand. But if you do read the Quran, you'll find that Muhammad simply does say he doesn't know if he'll find salvation. He's nothing but a plain warner. Now, on this point, Ghazali says, and this is the top scholar of Islam, I, I'm sorry, Abbas, I've never heard of you. Has anybody heard of you? Um, are you anybody? Should we care? Now, he says that Al Ghazali wrote that he explained that the Prophet used his personal judgment in judging between people and he was not free from error. So the top scholar of Islam says that Muhammad was not free from error. Al-Ghazali explained these matters in details that the Prophet can make errors in judgment. And he does this in his book, Usul al-Fiqh, like al-Mustasfa and al-Mahul. So Ghazali actually tells us the Prophet made mistakes, right? That he made mistakes in judgment. Now, what is also very, very interesting, uh, we can get to that verse in a minute, my little boy, but... Um, yeah, you clearly don't know your own Quran, but you're obviously trying to distract. Of course, in Islamic doctrine, Muhammad does say, and I covered this in my live stream last night, that if you use the words of a Muslim to sow discord, then you are sowing hatred, and this is slander. Right? This is actually a ruling from Muhammad, that to use the words of a Muslim to sow discord is hatred and slander. That's why Muslims take exception to us saying what they say because this is considered slander. In Western law, slander is when you lie about someone. Now, while this connotation is true within Islam, there's a secondary meaning of slander. The primary meaning of slander within Islam is to tell the truth that someone doesn't want told. To tell the exact literal truth that they don't want revealed. This is slander in Islam. Okay, it's called ghibba, right? And of course, there's a second called namima, backbiting. So there are two of these two of these doctrines that are discussed. You can read those in the Reliance. So they take exception to the fact because Muhammad said it's okay to lie if it brings peace. So of course, they can lie to us as long as it brings peace between us where we are not opposing them. So what I'm doing is basically I am showing things that... Uh, yeah, sorry. Wait, excellent. I, you're bringing this up. Yeah, I was going to bring that up, but yeah, that's a good point. That is, thanks. Yep. I didn't mean to bring it up yet. I didn't realize it would take... It's good. Go, go for it. Go for it. Uh, so, you know, uh, Abbas has told us that the Quran never said that Muhammad didn't know where he was going. And I, I guess he forgot about 46, 9, where Allah commands Muhammad to say, I am not something original among the messengers, nor do I know what will be done with me or with you. I do. I only follow what is revealed to me and I am not but a clear warner. So Muhammad says, com is commanded to say that he doesn't know what will be done with him. Are you going to tell us that Muhammad did know that he, what would be done with him and uh, Allah commanded him to speak a lie? Or are you going to admit that Muhammad uh, said these words and didn't know what was going to be done with him? Those are your two options. And you can reshare your screen at any time. Okay. Yeah, I'll show the same as well since he did bring this up. And I'll just, is my screen, no, it's not being shared, so I'll share my screen. Yeah, so I'll just share that again. Yeah, so in Quran 46.9, he's correct. 
Muhammad is nothing special and he's unsure of his own salvation. It says here, again, I'll, I'll do this because these are my notes and I've covered this previously on shows with, with Thaddeus. Say, I am not something original amongst the messengers, nor do I know what will be done with me or with you. Muhammad says he's ignorant. He doesn't know what will happen to him. I only follow that which is revealed and I am but a clear warner. And of course, it goes in Quran 2, 285, we make no distinction between any of his messengers. So Muhammad apparently is no different to any other messenger, except that's not true, right, Abbas? So, yeah, so let me go back to where I was a little earlier. Ah, I accidentally closed that. Um, ah, good grief. I actually just closed that. Let me just open it up again. No worries. While you're opening that, uh, Michael asked if your slideshows are available for us. I would like them want to study and look into it. Um, yeah, sure. I can make those available to you guys. Okay. So, yeah, I can make those available. Let me just bring up the chat again. Okay. So, am I busy sharing right now? Yes, I am. Yes, yes. Okay. okay so, yeah. So, um, Abbas, doesn't it bother you that we know Islam better than you do? Way better than you ever will, for that matter. So Quran did say blah, blah, not the point, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so notice, now he says here that Muhammad made, made errors. This is the top scholar of Islam, okay? Obviously, who is not on the same level as Abbas in the comment section, right? I like the little car, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so moving on. Now, this guy, Islamic scholarly agreement. So now we've got Dr. Saad Ramadan al-Buti, the jurisprudence of the prophetic biography. So in other words, what we're learning now is that the prophetic biographies, the Sira, actually also contains legislation law that is applied to so not just when they speak of the sunnah they don't technically mean the hadith they mean the biographies of muhammad the sirah so now the sirah also contains legislation and they tell us here that so he speaks al buti quoting various other scholars okay on the prophet's errors in judgment right so he speaks here of muhammad made errors in judgment like for the case of the prisoners of badr the jurisprudence okay translated so he says, on the question of captives, the Prophet's consultation with his companions in this regard, the decision which was made to grant the captives release in return for ransom of money, then the revelation of Quranic verses reprimanding, blaming Muhammad and his companions for this decision point to important principles. Right. So basically it says that this event serves as evidence that the Prophet possessed the right to engage in those who hold this view, and they are the majority of the scholars of Islamic jurisprudence. They reach this conclusion based on the question concerning the captives taken at Badr. That is not English. Whoever translated that just messed it up. If it was possible for the Prophet to engage in judgment, then it follows that it was possible for the resulting judgment to be incorrect. He says bluntly, it is possible for that judgment to be incorrect. However, in those cases where Muhammad's judgment was incorrect, and the scholars are telling us Muhammad's judgment was incorrect, right? The error would not be allowed to remain. Rather, a Quranic verse would reveal, would, would be revealed to correct Muhammad's mistaken judgment. So some abrogation was done specifically by Allah to correct Muhammad's mistakes. If no such verse was revealed following the judgment, this indicated that Muhammad's judgment had been correct, being in accordance with the Sharia. Now, I want to show you, um, I want to go to something, a um, brief quote here. Uh, while you're pulling that up, I'm going to put this comment up sure. on the screen yep. from uh, Muhammad Pito. He pointed out that Sahih Bukhari, volume 5, 266, also says the same thing as the Quran, that Muhammad doesn't know what Allah is going to do with him. So we have uh, Sahih Hadith, we have the Quran, and then we have a boss who doesn't want to believe either of them. Which of the three is the most authoritative? I'll leave the audience up to that, to decide that for themselves. Yeah, yeah, so, um, so the guy doesn't believe us, he doesn't believe his own Quran, he doesn't believe... Well, don't forget, they have to refute us, right? Even if it means contradicting, because don't forget that someone, so he's fulfilling a doctrine called commanding the right and forbid, forbidding the wrong. So we are doing wrong because, you see, we are reading the law of Islam. We are learning Islam not to embrace it, right? We are wrong for doing that. If we are going to read the glory of Islam, we should be embracing it, not criticizing it. We are wrong. So he is now commanding the right, enforcing the Sharia and forbidding the wrong, which is us. We are we are making corruption in the land. This is temptation away from Islam. And the only time that a Muslim actually gains 
actually when his words do not count against him and count for him is when he is commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. So he can lie in those cases, but he's doing it because actions are judged by the intentions within this doctrine, right? In Islam, your actions are judged by your intentions. So if you lie for the sake of Allah and for the sake of Islam, then Allah will forgive you this because you are not lying with bad intent. You are lying with good intent for the benefit of Islam, for the benefit of Allah, and therefore your words count for you and not against you. Otherwise, everything you say as a Muslim can count against you and send you to hell. Now, I want to know, when they speak of the Battle of Badr, final point, Allah tells Muhammad, a prophet must slaughter before collecting captives. Is this showing up at all? Yeah. Thank you. Yes, a prophet must slaughter before collecting captives. A slaughtered enemy is driven from the land. Muhammad, you craved the desires of this world, its goods and the ransom that captives would bring. But Allah desires killing them to manifest Islam. So Muhammad ransomed captives and made a little bit of money. And Allah said, I want you to murder your captives to manifest Islam. This is the glory of Allah. Praise be the word of Allah. Yeah, whatever. Disgusting. And yeah, and that's it. And this, of course, is the Encyclopedia of Islam, volume 13, page 442. So the act, so it says here, Nusk, the act of cancellation of abrogation and Quranic exegesis in the science of tradition and in law. Nusk is the generic label for concerning verses and traditions, which when compared, show frequent serious conflict. Contradictions, in other words. So yeah, so I think that that basically wraps it up. Oh, of course, yeah. And of course, if you read through the Encyclopedia of Islam, which is the gold standard of the study, academic study of Islam worldwide, not just in uh, hateful Christian universities, a comparison of verse with verse, hadith with hadith, hadith with verse, and Quran and hadith with the fiqh, with the Sharia law, suggest frequent, serious conflict. And therefore, Nasq is there to resolve these conflicts and to decide which of the rulings ultimately is the final ruling and what these mean. So, abrogation applies to Quran verses and hadith. And these hadith were the basis of the fiqh, of the law, which are now abrogated. Okay, so yeah, I think that basically wraps it up from me. Wait, 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 hold on. Yes. Um, actually, you know what? I'll, I'll leave it here. Uh, you guys can read this you know, in time later, but I think that sort of wraps it up. Um, your thoughts, Thaddeus? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, we, we've learned a lot about the Islamic doctrine of abrogation today. Uh, Abbas doesn't seem to want to talk about that topic. I don't know if he just came in late, but all he wants to talk about is this idea that Muhammad did know he was going to paradise. His pushback here is that you totally misunderstand the verse. It means that Muhammad did not know what Allah will give him. It, you must understand Quran holistically. And Quran is full of good news of paradise to Muslims and Muhammad. So a couple things I'll say on that. First of all, uh, you know, I, I agree that we should understand the Quran in its historic context. We should understand uh, we shouldn't pull verses out of isolation, but just saying that doesn't change the meaning of the verse. Uh, you know, I have in front of me quite a number of translations. None of them say anything about giving. Uh, Sahih International. I know what will, uh, I do, nor do I know what will be done with me. Uh, Muhammad uh, Mushin Khan, nor do I know what will be done with me. Uh, Yusuf Ali, nor do I know what will be done with me, and so on. All of them seem to say the same thing. And it's very interesting that all of these trans professional is Muslim scholarly translators all think it seems to be in what will be done with me, and you think it means uh, what Allah will give to me. Very, very interesting stuff. Nor have you provided any uh, scholarly interpretation that says it's about giving stuff, nor have you provided any other Quran passages that contradict Muhammad not knowing his destination. You know, I, I can throw out a number of other Quran passages that teach the same thing, that Allah determines who goes to heaven and there is nothing you can do about it. You can't do enough good works to guarantee yourself and know where you're going. Uh, you know, uh, Muhammad's companions say the same thing in the Hadith. Abu Bakr says, even if I had one foot in paradise, I still would not believe that that is where I'm going to end up because all his deception c 
could kick in and he could throw me out of paradise with just been tricking me my whole life made me look like i'm right there about to enter paradise and then says nope sorry uh, that wasn't my will for you so too bad you know, on that point, let me actually read this, what I have up on the screen. I think this will be valuable to people. So let me go to the Encyclopedia of Islam, Volume 7, page 1009. This is, as I said, the gold standard. To buy a copy will cost you just under $40,000, right, to buy a copy of this. Um, but I know a guy, right? So the ruling in the Quran, 2180, that the Muslim make testamentary provisions for parents and nearest kin was thought to have been revoked on the re revelation of 4, 10 to 11, Right? whose rulings are locked to the relative specific shares and deceased estate. Now, what's interesting is that um, as Islam defender Yahya does not know, because Islam defender Yahya doesn't know enough Islam to defend it, right? There's no idea what he's talking about, but this is actually written by some of the best scholars in Islam, right? For the best Muslim scholars. So many verses counsel patience in the face of the mockery of the unbelievers, while other verses incite to warfare against the unbelievers. The former are linked to the Meccan phase when the Muslims were weak, and were too weak to do other than endure insults. The latter are linked to Medina, where the Prophet had acquired the numbers and the strength to hit back. The discrepancy between the two sets of verses indicate that different situations called for different regulations. This is an instance of Nasq in the Quran. Chronology is the key to the resolution of the difference, since a divine book cannot contain contradictions. Right, this is Quran 482. The principal component of the general concept of Nasq is change or replacement. Right. To this was joined the notion of withdrawal, omission, right? but solely in relation to the operation of Nask upon the Quran. So the last two employ the term Nask appear to suggest the possibility. Now here they've got these verses in the Quran in Roman numerals. right? So you've got 87, 67, and you've got 13, 39. You've got 1786, and you've got 1252 and 2106. The last two, which employ the term Nask, appear to suggest the possibility of Muhammad's forgetting revelations. And we know there are hadith that show us that Muhammad actually forgot revelations. Go to the bottom. There are references to, there are references to events in the life of the Prophet, which consolidated the notion of his forgetting. Muhammad forgot. Muhammad made mistakes. And due to this revelation, new revelation, abrogation had to become, because had to come down to fix Muhammad's mistakes because Muhammad would forget something, say something, people believed him. Turns out he forgot something. Allah had to go, oh, you idiot, you forgot. And Allah comes out with a new revelation to fix Muhammad's faulty memory. So yeah, I thought this, so this is very important. So this is something that Muslims are embarrassed by. And of course they can't handle this. They want to try and change the subject. So that's me, that is. Speaking of trying to say, change the subject, uh, Yahya, has one final comment that I like to read because he gives me a good opportunity to promote our other content. He says, have not Paul abrogate all the teaching of Jesus and you Dumbo follow blindly. Well, uh, Lloyd has is in the middle of a, I believe it'll be six parts series. Something like what, that, yeah. Whether uh, Paul and Jesus taught the same message. So, you know, if you actually want to answer that question, which I, I have a feeling you don't actually want a real answer, but, you know, if you want the answer, did Paul teach the same message as Jesus, head on over to Lloyd's channel and check out that six-part series that he's doing with Ask Truth Apologetics. Or if you want a shorter version, uh, Lloyd, myself, and Io from the Third Apology did a show on that same subject uh, last month. I will put a link to that in the comments as well. So, you know, if you want, if, if you want to actually answer this question, whether the letters of Paul teach the same message as the uh, Gospels of Jesus, you can look into it. If you just want to keep repeating lies because that's all you have, uh, lies that intend to distract, well, by all means, just keep repeating lies and and uh, see how that works out for you on Judgment Day. Yeah, notice how Islam defender Yahya doesn't know Islam, cannot defend it, and isn't able to actually deal with Islam itself. I don't see him coming with any. And uh, so you say you're too busy to go deal with Yasser Qadi's lies. We've just revealed that Yasser Qadi is the biggest liar in Islam today, Yasser. Uh, Yahya, why aren't you going off to deal with that? We didn't make up a story. We just read to you what your own scholars say. We've just revealed to you that your own scholars are liars. 
nothing but liars, according to you anyway. So why aren't you running off to go and deal with that? They have an audience of literally millions. Why are those lies acceptable to you, Yahya? Unless they're not lies and you're just lying to us. So uh, a boss did confirm that he joined Lay and that's why he wasn't talking about abrogation. Uh, but he says in his understanding, there are no more ten than 10 verses of the Quran abrogates, I think he meant are abrogated, but none has to do with contradiction or forgetfulness. Well, I, one, I would say go back and actually watch the, the show. You know, we, we go through he was the work. On during that period. He was in the chat during the period when I discussed those things. Uh, regardless, I, I'd say go back and watch from the beginning. You know, this is the textbook of Yasser Qadi. So if you're going to tell me that it's wrong, then I guess you're going to tell me that Yasser Qadi doesn't know Islam. It's amazing how it, no matter what scholar of Islam we go to, we get people in the chat saying that they that person has no understanding of Islam uh, based on their own very limited knowledge, which consists of, I believe the things that I want to believe and I ignore everything else. But let's, uh, let, let's pretend for the sake of argument that there are only 10 verses that were abrogated. His other claim here is that it has nothing to do with contradiction or forgetfulness. He was definitely here when we were quoting the Islamic scholars on uh, Muhammad's forgetfulness, Muhammad's <laughs> errors. Um, so again, you tell me your scholars are wrong, fine. Tell me your scholars don't know what Islam is. And that's just all the more reason why no one should convert to Islam. If even the best and brightest scholars have no clue what the religion's about. But I want to address specifically this idea that they're not contradictory. So one of the many th examples of abrogation in the Quran is early on Muslims were told they were allowed to drink alcohol. Later they were told they are not allowed to drink alcohol. Uh, please explain how drinking alcohol and not drinking alcohol are not a contradiction. Uh, I'll look forward to your reply. Yeah. Yahya actually decided to step over the line again because he obviously feels hurt and now he's going to lash out and insult the way Yasser Qadi did. Your God lost the foreskin of his willy and Paul cancels circumcision. So we'll just go ahead and put Yahya back into timeout. Yeah, you know, he's been, been, yeah. yeah, he's been begging for a block. Uh, maybe we will just have to give him what he wants and permanently block him from my channel because he never says anything relevant and uh you know on a serious note i i i've watched his behavior carefully for a year now someone earlier said he's just an attention seeker uh, i think that he very well may suffer from a narcissistic personality disorder where the only thing he wants is attention regardless of he doesn't even care if he makes Islam look bad in the process. He just wants attention. And I really don't want to encourage that behavior. You know, he serves a purpose by coming in here and making Islam look bad. But at the same time, uh, if he is suffering from mental illness, I want him to seek professional help, not just continue to enable him. Right. Um, Tragana asked, why the surahs in the Quran not according to Revelation? Who dared to change the order? It's not just the surahs that are in the wrong order. The actual verses themselves are also often not in the right order. So, for instance, you know that the Quran is generally, loosely speaking, arranged from sh longest to shortest chapters, right? This was a deliberate choice. They claimed that it was Muhammad that revealed them in that order. But not only that, the actual verses themselves are not chronological either. Understand that. So, when you have verse 1 to 100, it doesn't mean they were revealed in that order. The scholars know that the, what the order is. It could be 1, 7, 9. 53, 7, 21, 19, 38, 62. However, you think it's just 1 to 100, but no, they've actually mixed it up to make it hard and impenetrable to understand. I follow, so Abbas is saying, I follow Quran and Sunnah, not scholars that are in there. They are not infallible, which is another lie because the Sharia actually teaches they need to follow a scholar. It's called taklid, right? There's another term for it called ittaba. Right, so they actually do have to follow. So he's actually just flat out lying to us here because oh. the only defense he has is to say, well, I, I would disregard the scholars. They don't want us talking about this. No one listens to him. He's no authority. He's nobody in terms of Islamic knowledge. So he has to because they know that the scholars are the inheritors of the authority of Muhammad. Okay, and if you don't follow the scholars, you're not following Muhammad because no single Muslim stands alone. They're like ants. 
It's like an ant colony. No single ant means anything. It's you're only an ant in relation to the colony. And um, so, yeah, Abbas is not actually following any kind of doctrine. Notice, he's, if I ask him to quote me the, sh the, the Sharia and the Fiqh, what school he belongs to, that they can't, because you know that once you have them, once you have them pegged to, I follow this, and this is my doctrine, they know that you have them pegged. They, they, so therefore they have to, they dance around. They never want to admit anything, right? So they can dance around and deny, deny, deny. But it's too late, dude. We know this stuff, and better than you do. Prove me wrong. Show me the fifth. Yeah. So anyway, so, that's that's me. Yep. So uh, a boss tells us that nowhere does the Quran say you can drink alcohol. He apparently has not read Surah sixteen. 67 where it says and from the fruits of the palm trees and grapevines you take intoxicant and good provision indeed it, in that is a sign for the people who reason so are you suggesting that allah is uh not saying that it, alcohol is a good thing in that verse uh you know and, and it's funny because this is one of the classic examples of abrogation that muslims always go to it's one of the 10 examples that Abbas thinks is valid. I guess he doesn't really know what the Quran teaches, though, um, because he's or he's purposely lying, one or the other. But this is one of the classic examples. And the idea is that early on, it was too difficult for the Muslims to accept uh, that they couldn't drink. So to allow Muhammad to attract a following, all originally allowed it. And then he changed his mind when the following got large enough and it was no longer necessary. That's the classic explanation I've heard from dozens of different Muslims, and here you are telling me that it doesn't exist at all. Uh, go figure. Agreed. Agreed. Also, he claims that all I have to follow is Muhammad and the Quran. It doesn't tell me anything. So ask those who recall, if you know not, that's Quran 1643. That's actually in the Sharia, in the section called the Quranic Evidence for Following the Scholars, which is an entire section which tells us that Muslims are obliged, obligated to follow the scholars, right? So now, of course, what this means is if you translate that as the Sharia does for us, it says that they have to follow people of knowledge. And of course, as we know, the people of knowledge, as Muhammad says, the, peop the people of knowledge are as far above the lay Muslim as I am above the least of you. So the people of knowledge, the ulama, are as far above the lay Muslims as Muhammad is above the least of the Muslims. So again, he's just being entirely dishonest. Either he's ignorant in which case we should not be listening to him. By the same token, he's just lying to us. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming at this point that this constant ignorance cannot just be an accident. It must be deliberate deception. Yes, uh, you know, it, it's very... He says that no one is infallible other than Allah and Muhammad. Uh, it's one that's very interesting that you're making Muhammad infallible because that puts him on the same level of, as God. Um, something that we say all the time that Muhammad is the second god of Islam. Uh, but regardless of that, I, you're going with your own personal interpretation. But since when is your personal interpretation infallible? Who is more likely, furthermore, who is more likely to have a correct interpretation of the Quran? Muhammad and his companions and the scholars that had direct access to those people, the people among the first three generations of Islam, on which uh, you know all the scholarly works are based, or you who just reads half a verse out of context, forgets that there are verses, other verses of the Quran that don't seem to agree with your beliefs, ignores whatever you don't like, and has uh, no knowledge of the, or or I shouldn't say no knowledge. I don't know your level of knowledge. So I'll just say incomplete knowledge of the historical sources. He was, I assume, has not gone to school for a dozen years to study these things carefully like the top scholars of Islam have. Yeah, can I share something while we're here? So just just to, um, this is a section in, I'm not going to go through every single reference and every single page, but this is the superiority of sacred knowledge. Now the scholars, the alim have sacred knowledge. Am I sharing right now? I should be, right? Uh, yeah, let me add it to the stream. Okay, thanks. The superiority of sacred knowledge over devotions. So this guy is simply being, he's a taklid. He's just doing what's called taklid, following, right? He's simply just a little follower. That's, that's all he is. So 
of those who know and those who do not know equal. Now, he's not the one who knows because those who know and those who know not are not equal. When they say the people who know, they mean the, ul the ulama, okay? They're referring to an alim, someone who knows, someone who's a learned scholar of Islam, right? And this guy doesn't know. He'd be quoting me out of the, well, he'd, he'd be destroying me with quotes from the Sharia and all that sort of thing. The prophet said, okay, the superiority of the learned Muslim over the devotee, like Abbas here in the comments, this, this no name, no nothing Abbas, is as my superiority over the least of you. So Abbas, tell me if Muhammad was lying about that. L let me know. Let me know if your prophet was a liar. So the prophet said, the superiority of the learned Muslim over the devotee is as my superiority over the least of you. <clears throat> the superiority of the learned Muslim over the devotee is like the superiority of the moon over the stars. The learned are the heirs of the prophets. The prophets have not bequeathed dina nor dirham, but have left sacred knowledge, and whoever takes it has enormous share. So are you one of the learned? And the scholars here, according to the Sharia, are the heirs of the prophets. Sacred knowledge, meaning the knowledge we're discussing, is a communal obligation. And of course, the scholars are responsible for the communal obligation of sanctifying the Islamic community, whereas the obligation of the individual is restricted merely to himself. And of course, he has to follow the scholars. So unless he's a scholar, he really has, he honestly has no relevance. His words have no relevance. So, so yeah, please explain to me if your, if your prophet was lying to us. I know you're going to do the miracle of reinterpretation here, but uh, I'd like to know more from you since you're a scholar. And please explain to me from the school of fiqh that you follow, because we know you follow one. And you can try and tell me you don't, but we know you do. Um, yeah, that's just all I wanted to, to put out there, just to give him. I mean, th this goes on. There's much more to this as well. But, um, you know, he, they'll simply deny everything because they don't want to be pinned down because they just want to deny, deny, deny. So Michael says, what I learned today is that Islam is so confusing, it looks like they just make it up as they go along. And I would like to thank our Muslim guests for helping to illustrate that. That You know, we, we literally read words from a, a Islamic scholars, and then they come in and tell us that we're full of hot air. Uh, we have no clue what we're talking about. And uh, it definitely looks like someone's just making up things as he goes along. Uh, we, we see this through the doctrine of abrogation. We see this how, you know, Muslim scholars had to create this idea that the unchanging, all knowledgeable creator of the universe just changed his mind from time to time. Um, that Muhammad could say things that contradicted his God's words. And that was because, uh, you know, because apparently Allah had changed his mind on that as well. And then we see it from Muslims in the comments today telling us that we have no clue what we're talking about when we're reading Islamic scholars. They, they tell us that uh, the, the plain meaning of a, a verse is not what it means. That when it says, I do not know what Allah will do with me, it means I do not know what gift Allah is going to give me for my birthday. And uh, it, we're just seeing confusion all around. So. This is our ad for Islam from our, our Muslim friends in the comment. If you if you want a religion that is very confusing, no one knows what's correct, the scholars have no clue what is correct about it, uh, the best and brightest scholars of all time can't hold a candle to the YouTube commenters, well, then convert to Islam. If you want a God that is consistent and is not confusing, then I suggest you check out our content about whether Paul and Jesus taught the same message. There's a lot of information in that as well about how the Old Testament also teaches the same message. And you can see that there is consistency in Christianity. We do not have this idea that a consensus of scholars is infallible. We do not have this idea that uh, each individual, um, uh, we, we don't have this idea that people have to follow the, the scholars. And we certainly don't have this idea that uh, Jesus said one thing in the first year of his ministry, a different thing in the third year of his ministry, and you got to go to school for 12 years to learn the exact order of everything that said so you know what is valid and what to actually follow. Anything you'd like to say? Uh, yeah, no, I've said what I, yeah. Um, no, yeah, look, I think, <laughs> no, you've made some, some great points. Um, I think we've covered this. Um, 
yeah, these Muslims are really following a set of rules, but they, they have to lie. We're not supposed to know because any of us who studies this for the sake of disparaging Islam is considered to be spreading hate. And they need to fight us, at least verbally in the text, as, as much as they can. So, um, unfortunately, Islam forces them to lie. And it, it really, it's, it's a very, very sad situation. Right? They'll lie about their own text. They'll lie about Muhammad. They'll throw him under the bus at any moment. So this is just, it's really, really unfortunate. And these are the words of their best scholars. And I'll tell you what my opinion is. Well, I don't care what your opinion is, really. I don't. Show me. Bring me your best scholars. Bring me the top works of your Sharia, right? Of your fiqh, of your top, top scholars. And then show me where they have a different opinion, right? Where I'm wrong. Show me in a scholarly manner. And I wish you lots of good luck with that. Excellent. Uh, we have a, uh, had a super chat donation from Murat Tanyal. No comment, but I did want to thank him very much for the donation. We appreciate all the support we get. Uh, you know, it, it helps uh, cover the, the little expenses that go into making these and to compensate for all the time that we spend on these. Obviously, we don't do it for the money. If we did, we'd be utterly insane getting, you know, two cents an hour or something. <laughs> Uh, when, when you'd work that out, but we really appreciate the donations. We really appreciate the thought behind them. Yeah. Uh, Abbas is going on about our cause not allowed. Yes, eventually it wasn't allowed, but the thing is the Quran says that, you know, there's some good in alcohol and it says it's no good in alcohol. So which is it, man? Which one? Some good, no good. And of course, yeah, as someone pointed out, the Hadith do say, don't show up to the mosque drunk. How did they get drunk? Drinking camel wine? <laughs> Yeah, and you know that doesn't say don't drink. It says don't. It, it doesn't even say don't get drunk. It just says don't go to the mosque when you're drunk. So that's a pretty light prohibition, yeah. I'd say. It doesn't say don't drink. Yeah, this is a. Oh, this is a malu. It's an old. It's a model Polish car. I built. I uh, got for Christmas one year. It's a Fiat something or other. This was like it's a tiny. It's the smallest car in the world. So just someone mentioned it in the comments. Yes, uh, so so, Yusuf asked if what you were showing earlier was the reliance mm -hmm. of the traveler. <laughs> so you go, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. No, that that's reliance. Um, look, the major manual in the okay. So the reliance is a single volume summary. It contains a little bit of everything. It's fantastic. The major Sharia manual, the most common one, outside of that, the one that's actually used in courts. For instance, in Pakistan, Bangladesh, certain parts of India, is in fact it is the major legal manual for for the Pakistani court system is the Hedaya, right? 2,652 pages in the volume that I've got, four volumes, two, over two and a half thousand pages. It is still in use today in Pakistan's courts, right? Understand, so the Hedaya, because it's part of the Hanafi school, but no single Sharia manual, it's just from one school only. They take rulings from all four of the schools, you know? So, so um, don't buy the story that no one knows what's going on. They know exactly what's going on. They just want you to believe otherwise. So Excellent. helpful for medicinal purposes. <laughs> so they, so people got drunk for medicinal purposes and went to mosque. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so so you, you kind of addressed this a little with your last comment, but I, I think uh, this is a good question from Michael. He says, which it is or are the most important sources of authority for Muslims, the Quran and the Hadith or the Sharia? The Sharia. You literally, literally, you can take all the hadith, all the Qurans, throw them in the sea, never see them again. The scholars wouldn't care because they don't reference those books. Scholars do not read the hadith directly. They don't grab Bukhari and go read Bukhari. They go to the tafsir of Bukhari. They go and read Askalani. They don't say, what did Bukhari say? They go, say, what did Askalani say Bukhari said? Understand? They go read the exegesis of the Hadith. Do you have a copy of Askalani? Ever heard of it? No, you don't. You don't know nothing about it. So unfortunately, I will say that we in the West have been negligent. And I'm being polite when I say we because it, I don't, I'm not referring to myself here. Um, we in the West have been negligent by not understanding Islamic law and its, its critical role. It, is, it, is the pre it has the preeminent role in Islam. Everything it's, it's the, it's the final, it is the final culmination of everything in Islam it is the Sharia and the Fiqh. So, most of the Quran has been abrogated. Very little of it exists. If you read the Sharia, you'll find very few verses. I mean, look, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing here. I'm sucking this number out of my thumb. But when I read the Sharia and I count the number of Quran verses that are still quoted as being relevant, right, 
because these are where the law and the every single rule from law from warfare legal social you name it sales contracts prayer religion you name it maybe 200 verses so 99 percent of the quran has been abrogated quite literally look in the sharia see how many count the number of islamic of verses and in the hadith they quote very few hadith so of the 1.9 million hadith that i know of 1.9 million that is not a typo okay only something less than half a percent made it into the volumes that we know of today right and of those a few a handful made it into the sharia those are the ones that are still relevant today so so yeah the scholars don't refer to the quran because muslims lay muslims are limited to the quran only and some hadith the scholars have a higher level of understanding lay muslims are at the bottom level the ibara plain understanding your scholars like Yasser Qadi are at the Ishara, a higher level of understanding, which the lay Muslim is forbidden from pursuing. Ask these guys in the comments to quote me the Sharia. They'll never do it, ever. I'll tell you flat out, they will never. Abbas, too much of a coward, will never do it because that's betrayal of Islam. That's betraying the Islamic nation. That is actual treason, according to Islamic law. And it's revealing the secrets of the Muslims, and he can be killed for that under Sharia. Allah will punish him, send him to hell for that. So he will never reveal the Sharia to me. And I'll, I'll say this bluntly, knock yourself out, buddy. Show me. He won't ever, no one ever does it. That is correct. That is correct, right, Thaddeus? No one ever has. That is correct. You know, we've done quite a few shows on Sharia. We've had, um, I would say, more than a dozen different Muslims join during live. A couple hundred Muslims write in the comments afterwards. And we've challenged every single one of them to bring us any Sharia source from any school of thought that contradicts what we say, and no one ever does. Sometimes they say it exists, and they're, it's not their job to, to show us where, or something along those lines, but usually they just ignore it entirely and, and say, I, I, I don't have to follow that, I can follow whatever I want to follow, uh, or, the, you know, the, or whatever, and it doesn't matter which particular Sharia source we quoted, Whatever one we quoted, they'll say, that one's not reliable. We'll say, well, what one is reliable? We get silence. Yeah, yeah. So understand, so you've got these four levels. Ibarra, Ishara, Lataif, Hakaik. The top scholars at the upper levels. Your lay Muslim is nobody. He's, he's at the bottom level, the plain understanding. So he doesn't have that. We have access. We, we are looking. We are even below them. Don't forget, we are the lowest of creatures, the worst of beasts. We are looking at Islam from the bottom looking up and going okay from a lower level than the average muslim the scholars laugh at us because they're looking at from the top through the for these 1400 years these major scholars have written all of these things and they're looking at through the filter of all of that scholarship for the last 1400 years and we ignore that that is negligent western scholars and academics even apologists are largely negligent by by doing this by failing to regard what islam actually believes the sharia clarifies everything i hope that answers that uh, have I said anything overly controversial? I guess perhaps in some way, but but that is your thoughts on that. Nope, I, I, I think that's good. Uh, KL said that Sharia is a big red line, referring to Yasser Qadi's speech where he said there's certain uh, red lines that the Muslim will not cross. So let's pick that apart. And uh, with what Lloyd said, also referencing Yasser Qadi, since he is yep. part of our theme of today, uh, you know, he says that we are ultra crepidarians. Uh, <laughs> because we don't have good knowledge about islam yet we speak about it and uh lloyd's pointing out one of those areas where yasser Qadi has all this knowledge of course he's not going to share it but he knows that we don't have the same knowledge so he knows that we can't properly judge islam because we don't know what is uh, abrogated and what is not yeah and uh speed and angels asked if that's why Qadi is so arrogant uh, of course i don't know Cotty's mind but i'm sure that that is one aspect of it that he, you know he has these 12 years of, of study yeah. in school and then another 20 years working in academia since then cool. he thinks he's well beyond us he thinks that uh, we are pathetic peons in comparison no, true. Well, why are we doing exegesis of the Quran? Oh, the Quran says, let me think about, they've had 1400 years to do this. Do you think they haven't done it? Do you think they honestly haven't figured out what it all means and written it down? Yes, they have. 
thousands of books. You don't need all thousands of them because these are all summarized and summarized and resummarized until they've got a handful of books that are the final, final say. And it's right there. Why are we trying to do exegesis when the laws have been written? You can read them in black and white. You can pick up the book and read it and they'll tell you this is what it says. No confusion. Um, and then I'll just uh, close with this comment. I'll, so you have to convert to Islam to see what is in Islam, LOL, and that is very true. Uh, the Sharia explicitly says that Islamic short sources, including the Quran, incidentally, should not be shared with non-Muslims unless they are in the process of converting to Islam. So you have to accept Islam, then you can learn what Islam teaches other than, you know, some vague generalities, which may or may not even be true. So this is what, uh, what Islam has to offer. You have confusion, you have abrogation, you have uh, Muslims who tell us their scholars are clueless. You have blind acceptance of what is in Islam. And this is the ad for Islam. I, I'm, I'm sure that everyone watching will agree that this sounds like the perfect religion that we should all be converting to. I mean, what kind of religion that has truth uh, doesn't want to hide it from everyone else. Uh, that's obviously a mark of truth, right? <laughs> if, if you have truth, you want to keep it to yourself. Uh, of course not. And of course, this is ridiculous. And then, of course, if you do decide to convert, well, good luck leaving because there is a death penalty for leaving Islam. What a perfect combination. The most amazing religion in the world. I'm sure we will all agree. Compare this to uh, Christianity. We're quite open and honest about Christianity. We don't claim that the Bible has been perfectly preserved right down to the letter. We don't make up nonsense claims about the Bible uh, predicting scientific advances. Uh, instead, we say, let's look at this from an honest historical approach. Let's look at the text. Read the text. We, we want you to read all of our texts. We don't want to hide any of our, our information for us. We want you to, uh, the more information you have, the better it is for Christianity because we have truth on our side. Uh, we want you to examine our sources. We want you to ask honest, critical questions. Uh, but when you get a response, uh, we want you to actually listen to that, not just try to find something that you can dishonestly use against us. So, uh, you know, I'll leave it up to the audience which they think is a better option. The Christianity that says, we're not afraid of you examining our sources, or Islam that says, you need 20 years of knowledge to examine our sources. And if you don't have that and you speak on it, you, you and you're not a Muslim, you're doing something wrong. If you are a Muslim and you say false things for the benefit of Islam, that's all right. If you say true things that hurt Islam, that's not all right. Uh, so either you have to study for 20 years or you have to blindly accept what your imam told you. Those are your only two options. Any closing words from you? Um, I know, just this someone asked, is the, is the Sharia more embarrassing? It's much more explicit. Um, it's horrifying, actually, when you read it. Um, no, so that's it, guys. Uh, yeah, my channel's been doing really well. I'd like you to... Uh, my channel, youtube.com, Lloyd De Jong. <laughs> my full name is De Jong, not De Jong, not De Jong, De Jong. Uh, guys, please, uh, yeah, sign up if you'd like to know more. I do live streams and I've been doing videos and I will be on Thaddeus' channel and hopefully soon Thaddeus will be on my channel. I'm looking forward to that for the first time. Yes, yes, I definitely um, look forward to being on Lloyd's channel. We've been talking so, about it for a while. We, it just Timing just hasn't worked out, uh, but we'll definitely do that soon. Yeah, I'm finally getting the hang of it. <laughs> <laughs> And we did have a request not to block Yaya, so I will leave him on block for now. But at some point, you got to just uh, get rid of the trolls instead of feeding them. So we'll, we'll leave him on block for now, but uh, his days are probably numbered. One yeah. quick announcement before we leave. Uh, on Christmas Eve morning in the United States, so afternoon in Europe or evening in uh, Asia, I will be having a live stream to celebrate the birth of the Savior. It'll be here on the Reasoned Answers channel. Uh, we'll do similar to what I do weekly on my other channel, the Reasoned Worship, where we go through uh, some biblical passages and discuss the meaning of them where, uh, live. 
audio and YouTube chat are both options. So join us for that. We'll have some Christmas music and have a good time worshiping God together. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, be sure to subscribe to Lloyd's channel. And if you're interested more in abrogation, check out the link that I will post here shortly. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your day, whether that's just beginning or coming to an end. And God bless. Great discussion. Thank you. Good night.